This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Pauline Carr and I'm the Chancellor of the University of South Australia. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre and the University of South Australia for what promises to be an inspiring and thought-provoking conversation with the Honourable Julia Gillard AC, as she shares her experiences and advice from extraordinary women leaders as part of her new book, Women in Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons. Sworn in as the 27th Prime Minister of Australia on the 24th of June 2010 and serving in that office until June 2013, Julia is the first woman to ever serve as Australia's Prime Minister or Deputy Prime Minister. As Prime Minister and in her previous role as Deputy Prime Minister, Julia delivered nation-changing policies, including reforming Australian education at every level from early childhood through to university education, creating an emissions trading scheme to combat climate change, improving health care, commencing the first ever national scheme to care for people with disabilities, addressing the gender pay gap for social and community sector workers, and delivering an apology to all those who had suffered through the practice of forced adoptions. In 2012, Julia received worldwide attention for her speech in Parliament on the treatment of women in professional and public life. She currently serves as the inaugural chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London, which through research, practice and advocacy is addressing women's underrepresentation in leadership. She is chair of Beyond Blue, one of Australia's leading mental health awareness bodies and Chair for Global Partnership for Education, a global funding body for education in developing countries. We're also very proud to say that in 2017, following her annual Hawke Lecture presentation, Julia was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of South Australia. And we very much appreciate her involvement in the university community and the ongoing promotion of the benefits of education and the opportunity it presents to transform lives. It is now my very great pleasure to welcome the Honourable Julia Gillard AC in conversation with Julia Lester. Julia Gillard, welcome to the Hawke Centre. Thank you, terrific to be here. It's a great honour to have you. And we are today talking about, well, many things, women and leadership, both the concept and I will put the book <laughs> in front of us all because this has pulled together so many ideas and so many great women, co-authored by you and Ngozi okonjo Wela, subtitled Real Lives and Real Lessons. And we'll come to all of that as well as we chat. So could you we begin just by asking you to tell us your, about your co-author? So who is Ngozi okonjo Wela? Ngozi is a friend of mine, but we've come to know each other in recent years through attending international meetings together. So I chair the Global Partnership for Education, which is the multilateral fund that seeks to make a difference to school education in developing countries. And Ngozi chairs the Global Vaccine Alliance, which is uh, built to ensure that throughout the world, including in poorer communities, people get access to vaccines. And given we're, you know, making this in the era of COVID, Obviously, the Global Vaccine Alliance is hugely important. So we started attending meetings together, getting to know each other. We served on an international commission together about education. And we just got chatting about lives, perspectives. And increasingly, we started talking about women and leadership, our own experiences and what we were seeing around the world. And then we said, hey, let's write a book. So we did. 
two crazy busy women <laughs> at a crazy time writing a book from different parts of the world, travelling, travelling, travelling. You can't just charge in and write a book. So you very clearly structured this book and the interviews. And I wonder, firstly, if we could talk about the women that you chose to interview, because this is based on theory and real stories. How did you find your eight women? Yeah, we did want to uh, look at all of the research, particularly the psychological research about how people see women leaders, but tested in the real world. You know, women who have led, do they think that this research holds true or it's false? What are their experiences? And so when we first started talking, we thought, um, you know, how broad do we want to go? Do we want to focus on women in politics, women in business, women leading community organisations, women in the law? You know, you could have gone quite broad. We ultimately decided to focus on women in politics because we thought, you know, every experience about women and leadership is really played out on the most public of stages in politics. So we thought that that was kind of the foremost test. And then we decided we wanted to get perspectives from around the world of women who were either leading today or had been leaders. And so that led us to women who have led in countries as diverse as you know, Norway and Liberia. Uh, we wanted voices from all sorts of communities and backgrounds. I love the way at various parts of this quite serious book, I actually laughed out loud fairly frequently. Um, which I think you think is a nice idea. You hoped that would <laughs> we, happen, did you? When, when we were writing, uh, yeah. we had in our mind, what do we want readers to be doing? And certainly laughing out loud was one of the things we wanted from readers. We also wanted readers to be going, I can't believe that, you know, being presented with a new fact that they hadn't heard before. And we wanted readers to be saying, I'm determined to change that by the end of it. Yes, well, I think you've done all three of them, really. There's a lot of groaning of, oh, my goodness, are we still here? And some hideously awful moments, which we will come to. And some great triumphs, really. They're all there. So you asked all of these women the same questions, which obviously gives structure to your book. I wonder if we can just f talk about the women briefly and then let's get into what it was that you specially talked about. And uh, I'm just going to go in order. It's probably alphabetical. Jacinda Ardern. Yes, Jacinda Ardern from our region of the world doing such a fantastic job in New Zealand. And we wanted to interview Jacinda because she's a representative of a young leader. And of course, she had that experience of becoming a mother as Prime Minister. And we wanted one of the examinations to be, what difference does it make? How do people see women leaders when they have the status of being a mother? And so to interview someone who had her baby in the full public glare as Prime Minister was a very very special experience for us and brought a very different perspective to the book. And by the way, did you always meet face to face? Uh, yes, we. Uh, I saw Jacinda face to face. Ngozi was on the phone for that interview. So there were some times where we kind of tag teamed it and then most of them we did together. Because one of the things I really enjoyed about the book, Julia, was it does feel like real women. These are very powerful women, as you are, as Ngozi is. Um, I don't feel as though I'm sitting on the sidelines unable to reach these women. So thank you for doing, doing that. Um, Michelle Bachelet. Yes, she was the uh, president of Chile. Uh, she was actually president twice. Uh, and she's gone on to serve in various UN capacities. She led UN Women, uh, and now she is serving as the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. So a very accomplished woman. Uh, she uh, is someone whose life uh, was defined in early years by the fascist dictatorship in Chile. Her uh, father was uh, tortured until his heart gave out. She lost her father to the dictatorship. She fled here to Australia with her mother to join her brother who was already in Australia. So there's a lovely connection there. Uh, she did studies around the world and ultimately returned to her own country to become the first woman president. And in fact, medical studies, and I love this, military strategy studies took her. Well, tell me about the two from what yes, you know. In incredible. Her uh, father had uh, always wanted to, her to be a doctor and uh, she 
was enthusiastic about that too. And against this very difficult uh, time in her life, she was a very young woman uh, when uh, the dictatorship took over and she had to go into exile. But she managed to complete her medical studies ultimately in East Germany. So she had to learn German. Uh, then when she returned to her home country and became more and more interested in politics, she wanted to better understand what was it that had enabled the military dictatorship? Why was it that uh, civilian leadership and military leadership had had such a fundamental breakdown of uh, dialogue and connection? And so she did undertake war studies effectively, uh, including in Washington. So she served as Minister for Health, then Minister for Defence before she became president. And I enjoyed her comments about the military when she said, look, I noticed the military never talks to ordinary people. It's such an obvious point, but it's a very difficult thing. And that, I gather, fired quite a bit of her interest. But when she became a, a, a serious leader herself, she actually liked the fact that the military really understood discipline. And if she said, I'm boss, they said, OK, you're boss. Yeah, she found it uh, kind of relieving in some ways that the uh, clarity of the hierarchy in the military, and this is in the post-dictatorship era, so obviously the military had uh, readapted to working with a civilian government and respecting ministers for defence. And so she found that even though she was uh, their worst nightmare in many ways, they were conservative men. Uh, she was a woman, she was divorced, she was from the progressive side of politics. So uh, if they'd put together an identikit of the minister they didn't want, they probably would have come up with her. And she was an atheist and they would have been very Catholic. Yes, that's yes, right. She's yes. not a religious person yes. and so a further sort of cultural clash. Uh, and yet their understanding of chain of command uh, meant that they gave her the deference that she was due as minister. It's an extraordinary story. It is. And we'll come back to some details. Joyce Bander. Yes, Joyce Bander was uh, the first and to date only woman president of Malawi. Uh, Malawi is a small landlocked country in Africa. Uh, it's poor, it's, um, you know, uh, industries are predominantly uh, agriculture, maize in particular, some limited forms of tourism. Uh, it's not, you know, where the big game uh, animals are, so it's not been enriched by the uh, tourism around safaris and the like. No gold, no diamonds. Uh, no, no gold, no diamonds. So a country in which uh, the likelihood of a girl finishing secondary school is still one in 10. Only one in 10 girls do 12 years of schooling. Uh, many of them don't make it to the end of primary school. So that's telling you a bit about the nature of the country. Uh, she became vice president uh, really after becoming uh, famous publicly for her activism around women. Uh, she fled a violent early marriage uh, and she uh, subsequently uh, remarried and uh, had more children in what was a happy marriage. But that early scarring experience meant that she spent a lot of time uh, focused on women's economic empowerment, bringing together women so that they could become business women, they could have their own money, their own choices in life. Uh, she came to attention because of that. She ran as vice president with a presidential candidate. Uh, and in the very stressed, topsy-turvy world of that politics, uh, he died in office and she became president as a result and served out the balance of the term. We use short sentences like that, don't we, to describe incredibly painful, difficult, tumultuously hideous times as well. It's so easy just to put someone's life in a list like that. I think I enjoyed again in your book that we do get to see much more of these women. You've mentioned twice already uh, marriages that were not just bad, they were violent, they were hideous. And so women and violence, even in these leaders, becomes part of our life once again. Yeah, I'm hoping that one of the things that this helps to do uh, is to bring stories we don't normally hear. Uh, so, you know, I think from the Australian perspective, we uh, obviously know a lot about our own 
own politicians. We tend to know a fair bit about New Zealand. We know a lot about the US. We still look to the UK. Uh, we have a familiarity with Asia. But there are stories from Africa, stories from South America that I think people wouldn't be as familiar with. And we're presenting these women's stories um, through our discussions with them, largely in their own words. And they've spoken very openly about what formed them, their childhood homes, um, their lives, their relationships, their experiences, including their experiences as women who have been such senior leaders. Hillary Rodan Clinton, the only one who didn't make it to be the ultimate leader, but as I, I did laugh at this line too, when you said something along the lines of, if we're talking about gender and politics and power, who else in the world has learned more than she has? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we use a line in the book uh, pr pretty close to uh, Hillary needs no introduction. And I think um, <laughs> Hillary does need no introduction. Uh, we're all very familiar with uh, Hillary's story, including uh, the very painful loss in 2016. And she uh, reflects on all of that and reflects on her life from her very early years, uh, what made her a, a school leader. Uh, she tells a wonderful story about uh, running for class president uh, when she's in school um, and losing out and one of the boys saying to her, because she lost out to a boy, one of the boys saying to her, whatever made you think that a girl was going to end up president? <laughs> and it's like... It's an awful <laughs> irony, isn't it? Yeah, it's oh. an awful irony. Insert all of these decades. Oh. Uh, and of course, many of us hope she would be president and can still remember where we were and how we felt when the news came through that she wasn't going to make it. We won't talk too much about all of that because there's too much detail, but um, she still really is astounded, isn't she? And says, we didn't know what had happened. Yes, yeah, she, in the book, um, and actually one of her staff members uh, who attended the interview, uh, we end up quoting in the book as well, a man called Nick Merrill, who's worked with Hillary for uh, a, quite a long period of time, including during the 2016 campaign. And both he and she made the point that they had amongst their campaign team, people who'd campaigned for President Obama, people who had worked on Democrat campaigns going back over years, uh, people who had supported political candidates who had got into all sorts of scrapes and troubles. And they would join the Clinton campaign sort of, you know, with a, we've got this swagger, we know what this is going to be like because we've campaigned for X or Y or Z in the past, but X or Y or Z were all men. And ultimately, these very seasoned campaigners, after some time on Hillary's campaign, ended up saying, you know what, this is different and it's different just because she's a woman. Yes, yes. Christine Lagarde. Yes, Christine Lagarde is a French uh, politician, uh, but she would be known to people predominantly because she led uh, the International Monetary Fund. And so that's different from the other leaders that we've discussed who uh, were... Uh, in capital P politics, if I can use that terminology. Uh, but we thought we should speak to Christine Lagarde because the IMF is such an important institution in our world. Uh, when you attend meetings like the G20, which I have as Australian Prime Minister, uh, when the, you know, nations with the biggest economies in the world come together, uh, Christine Lagarde, as head of the IMF, attended that with the same kind of status as a head of government or head of state. And so we thought, given she'd had that insight into global politics, that it would be terrific to talk to her. And she brought with that her earlier experiences. She led uh, international law firm Baker McKenzie. She was the first woman to do that. Uh, she was the first woman to be Minister for Finance, what we would think of as the treasurer equivalent uh, in France. Uh, and she was the first woman to lead the IMF. These are such daunting lists for many of us. They're such impressive women. I want to come back to... Um Christine Lagarde's wonderful comments about style soon, but we'll, we'll wait for that. Theresa May. Yes, I think people would know uh, Theresa May served as uh, Prime Minister in the United Kingdom. She was the Prime Minister uh, just before the current Prime Minister, Mr Johnson. Uh, she uh, came to office uh, when David Cameron... Uh, resigned because the Brexit referendum had been lost. So there was the vote, do you want to 
be in or not in the European Union. Uh, Prime Minister Cameron had campaigned on the basis that the UK should stay in. So when the vote went against that proposition, he thought the proper course was to resign. Uh, so uh, Theresa May became the second woman to lead the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher having held the position for 10 years, uh, starting in 1979. And so it was uh, interesting to see her experiences. Uh, she's a vicar's daughter, an only child. She obviously had a, a sense very early on that she wanted to be in politics and in conservative politics. Uh, she's someone who's always had a strong ethos and sense of duty. Um, she led the UK during the um, debate that followed the Brexit referendum about how to leave the European Union, which was a very fractious debate, and ultimately um, was not able to uh, command authority in her political party during that debate and resigned and Boris Johnson was elected. Uh, so it's a different experience. Uh, the others we've talked about, you know, Jacinta Ardern is the third a uh, woman to be Prime Minister in New Zealand. Uh, the other women we've talked about were firsts and Hillary would have been a first. Uh, Theresa May, the second woman leading the UK. And again, I think we'll turn back to that issue because in some ways that informs a country, I think, about what to do with this still strange thing called a female leader. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, will you tell us about her? Yes, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was in fact the first woman to lead a nation in Africa. She became president of Liberia uh, and Joyce Bander was the second woman uh, when she became uh, president of Malawi. Uh, people uh, may recall uh, that um, there was uh, a lot of uh, disturbance, civil wars in Liberia. People might remember the history about child soldiers. There was quite a lot of coverage um, in Australia and around the world at the time about very young boys being swept up into the civil war struggle. Uh, Liberia is a small nation in Africa. It was originally founded uh, to be a place that freed slaves from the United States could go and settle. Uh, so there was a, a threat in the abolitionist movement against slavery uh, that said, once slaves are freed, then they should return to Africa. Um, and, you know, a country was set up to receive them, Liberia. Now, of course, this had all the underlying tensions one would imagine, uh, you know, uh, people who have been slaves in the United States then uh, put in a land that they don't know. Um, and there are local Indigenous people who resent the newcomers. Uh, but against that, uh, the nation of Liberia has been formed. Uh, Ellen uh, grew up in considerable poverty, her father was a very noted man in Liberian politics. Uh, he was um, what they would refer to as an Indigenous man, so not uh, the um, descendant of one of the freed slaves, but a descendant from the local people. Kind of royalty, yes, really. Yes, he yes. was a tribal leader, as yeah. well as in um, the formal political system, he was a tribal leader. Uh, but he died when she was a teenager, her mother became the leader of her family. Uh, she always seems to have lived with the sense that she wanted to um, get back for her family, the sense of uh, status and engagement they had when her father was alive. But to end up president of Liberia, she uh, was in exile on a number of occasions. She was jailed on a number of occasions. She was given a sentence so long that uh, she viewed it as unlikely to that she was unlikely to survive it, that it would probably kill her. Uh, fortunately, international pressure freed her. Uh, and out of this, you know, tumultuous history, uh, she survived, she lived, she was able to return to Liberia and she ultimately was a democratically elected president. Uh, the first one after the situation normalised following these civil war struggles. It's a list that's quite extraordinary and it's a reminder, isn't it, that you make very clearly in your book that... Um, that to become a leader in some countries, you face death. Yes, and certainly uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf did. Uh, Joyce Bander in Malawi uh, also speaks about a, a failed assassination attempt. So these are women who have led in circumstances you and I, I think, can intellectually understand, but we've got no 
um, you know, direct way of really feeling that experience because we live in such a, you know, peaceful, prosperous country. Uh, so there is uh, so much to learn from reading these women's words. Erna so, Solberg. Last but by no means least, because we've gone in alphabetical order. So yes. Erna Solberg, uh, she's Prime Minister of Norway. She's not the first Prime Minister uh, to, a female Prime Minister to lead Norway. Uh, she's a political conservative. Uh, she uh, once again was someone who became interested in politics very young. She's one of three sisters. Uh, and she talks um, about being uh, mentored, indeed sponsored, um, into parliament by uh, a woman who was leaving. Um, and, you know, obviously very early on, the Conservative Party had its eye on her as a prospect for the future. Uh, she talks about how that then gave her development opportunities. They gave her jobs and things to do that helped her um, get, you know, ever broader policy skill sets. And she came to lead the political party. And I think her experience is so important because it gives such a big contrast to particularly the women from Africa. Whenever international organisations rank gender equal societies, uh, Norway is always round about up the top. You know, Norway, Finland, Iceland, places like that are always up the top. And so she can talk about, you know, what it's like to be a woman leader in a parliament where they deliberately design the day so people can go home and be there for the children's dinner time, you know, pick up from school, get the kids dinner and then go back and do more parliament. They've thought about that. Um, and so that's, you know, a very different it experience. It just makes you gasp, really, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And yeah. a very different experience yes. to other places around the world. I also enjoy the way that you've begun your book with a message from you and from your co-author. In a message from Julia, we find things we know, uh, many of us, and some things we don't know. You're very strongly saying, I've always been a feminist. Um, my anger, you write, gave me courage and propelled me to be one of the leaders. Would you just tell us your path really briefly from student politics to PM? You know, you do what you did for the others. <laughs> Bottle it into a few sentences. It's uh, hard, isn't it? Uh, to, you know, cut a long, 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 long story short, um, I first got interested in anything that looked like politics here at Adelaide University. I got involved in a protest campaign about student, um, about cutbacks to university funding. This is so long ago, it was under Malcolm Fraser's government in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And I got a taste through that, that you can make a difference to your community, to your nation, if you raise your voice and get involved. And so I got ever more senior in the student movement. I ended up being president of the National Union. I sort of slowly formed this intention that, yes, I'd like to be in politics. Uh, it took me quite a long time to get there. Uh, and then I was ultimately elected in 1998. And I think the rest is probably pretty familiar uh, to most Australians ending up being Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister. In fact, 10 years since you became Prime Minister. Yes, we are recording this on the 10 year anniversary. The fact that you were the first female Prime Minister was momentous news. One of the points that you make is looking back now that there are at least two things you would have done differently. There are probably thousands of little ones, but two big ones. Um, one of them in particular interested me, and that is when you would have started calling out sexism that you experienced. Now, we all know you're extraordinary misogyny speech. Looking back, if you'd given that speech earlier, if you'd called out earlier, would it have made a difference to how you were treated? I don't think it's so much about giving uh, that speech earlier. That's really not what I meant. I mean, that speech was very much of a particular moment and a particular context. Um, what, what I meant was there's, you know, so many ways, both subtle and unsubtle, uh, that in the early days of my prime ministership, my treatment was different to a man in the job. Um, whether it was commentary about clothing, whether it was um, less of a tendency by people who deal with you to 
um, you know, refer to you respectfully, you know, um, and I'm, I'm someone who's always very happy, you know, please call me Julia. But even before I'd made that statement, uh, people didn't so routinely apply the prime ministerial title as they had to men in the past, you know, just all sorts of ways in which uh, I was being treated differently, the framing of issues in the media. And I think if I had started then, right at the outset, when a few of those things happened to, to say, you know, you wouldn't be reporting it like that if I'd been a male Prime Minister. You wouldn't have all of those articles about uh, what the Prime Minister's wearing if I was a male Prime Minister. Can we actually talk about this? Uh, not in an accusatory way, but in an educative way, and hopefully have set some new norms and some new baselines. Um, I thought that, you know, I was getting some differential treatment, but that was because, you know, it was the first big whoosh about, oh, we've got, you know, the first female Prime Minister, and that over time that would normalise and it would go back to kind of business as usual, business as usual in Australian politics being pretty rough and tumble, uh, but not particularly uh, gendered. But what I actually found was, you know, the more uh, the government governed, the more decisions we made, some of them controversial, uh, the hotter the political water became, the more gendered the dialogue became. And then if you raised it then, it was met with a, oh, you're only saying that because the government's in political trouble and you're trying to distract from the political trouble. So you didn't have the space to just raise it in this more open fashion that I might have early on. So you, you call it shrill, in fact, don't you, that the, the anti-female became more shrill as time went past. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, many people would remember uh, some of the crazier things that happened, some of the language uh, on signs held up at protests, some of the things that were uh, said about, you know, about me by radio shock jocks, some of the, you know, pornographic pornographic cartoons that were circulated, the, um, you know, repulsive uh, menu um, referring to my body parts at a uh, Liberal Party fundraiser and, 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 and. And it's not really the purpose of the book to uh, recite all of that. Um, you know, rather it's I've learned from those things and um, I think, you know, if I can learn from those things, we can all learn from the real life experience of so many women leaders. You also suggest that perhaps you could have engaged supportive men, some supportive men, to call out the sexism as well. Yeah, we uh, certainly uh, make that point in the book and we actually make it one of the lessons for men that we ask men to reflect on and we certainly hope that uh, men read this book. Um, it's, a, it's a book for women and for men and it's a book in which we conclude with a chapter about lessons and some of them are specifically directed at men. And one of the lessons is it's actually um, easier for men to call out sexism than it is for women. Um, if a woman calls it out about herself, then, you know, people will receive that as almost inherently conflicted. Um, you know, she, she wants a promotion or she wants some form of treatment and is she really saying she's not getting it because um, of gender or is she using that as a cover for something else? Uh, whereas if a man says, and it doesn't have to be combative, it could be just in a meeting as the meeting goes on, oh, we seem to have heard from everybody, but we haven't heard from, you know, Susan or Maria, like, or um, as often happens, uh, the, the women or a woman in the room has raised a really good idea. Everybody's uh, passed over it. And then a man sometime later says, um, actually, why don't we do this? And people go, oh, that's genius. You know, actually reminding the room, oh, I think that idea was first raised by um, and pointing to the woman in the room. Um, if a man does that, then... I think it can make a big difference. It will be heard for what it is and a fair intervention about the gender relations. And actually the research shows uh, that uh, men who do call out sexism are viewed with greater approval um, by uh, colleagues uh, that they're surrounded with. They're viewed as being kind and nice. And that that is, quite surprised me. Yeah, that, and that's, uh, yes, it? Cor yes, correlated with promotions and a whole series of good uh, things. So uh, nothing to lose, nothing, nothing to, lose. to lose. All to gain and nothing to lose and you'll be doing the right thing. You start off the depth of the book with let's do the numbers. 
and the numbers are stats. We can't go through too many of them. Um, but it's pretty daunting, isn't it? You first of all look at women in leadership politically around the world, historically. Can you just give us a few of the numbers that, that matter? Yeah, look, we invited, um, uh, we invited people to play a numbers game with us and, you know, asked a series of questions where, um, you know, how, how many women have uh, won uh, the uh, best director at the Academy Awards and the answers won. And we then pose a whole series of questions where the, the real answer, the routine answer is zero. You know, how many women have led the United Nations? How many women have been president of the United States? And on and on it goes. Uh, we then present the numbers about how many nations around the world have been led by women. And to snapshot it really um, effectively, uh, you know, nations mostly have never been led by a woman. Um, we're down in the sort of, you know, 30% kind of range of nations that have ever been led by a woman. And then when we look at the number of times that women have led a nation more than once, that's an incredibly limited number. And New Zealand is one of the few countries in the world that's ever had a woman lead it three times. So um, it's possible for most of the world's population uh, to be there recounting on their fingers who's led their country and never to have lived a moment under the leadership of a woman. I was horrified but kind of laughed at your figure to say, if we continue it the way we're going, it's getting tiny, tiny bit better. It'll take us 95 years to get equal representation. I did laugh. To which you and Ngozi said, well, let's write a book then. Let's try and speed things up a bit. And that's the agenda that you've tried to set, really, isn't it? Let's, how can we speed this up a bit? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, things, things are changing. And um, I always want to point that out because I think it should give us a spirit of optimism. If we uh, convince ourselves that nothing's ever changed, then that's very demoralising. You know, I know in my own life, you know, I was... Uh, you know, born in 1961, I'll turn 60 next year. Um, if I look across my lifespan, things have changed a great deal for women. But the experts, for example, the World Economic Forum have war-gamed at the current rate of change. When are we going to see equal treatment in politics? And they've come out with this number, which is pretty close to 100 years, uh, which means, you know, a child born, as we're talking now, uh, will be, you know, Maybe, maybe we'll live uh, to see a gender equal world, but only just. They'll have to make, you know, 95 uh, to, to see it. Now, that's too slow. Uh, so if we can contribute practical ideas and we aim to do that in the book for change, then hopefully we can speed that up. And gender equal, of course, is a gigantic phrase, isn't it? Let's just first of all say gender. Um, gender was sort of in fashion in the 70s and 80s, certainly second wave feminism, and then sex became the way we described people again, male or female sex. You specifically use gender. What are you meaning there? Just so we're all yeah, on the um, same we, page. Uh, yes, what we mean there, of course, is uh, gender as we... Uh, discuss it in the book, we're talking about all of the stereotyping uh, that societies build around biological sex. Um, so, you know, uh, to, to give a silly example, uh, but uh, girl, girl babies and boy babies don't emerge into the world wearing pink and blue. Uh, they emerge into the world as little babies. And uh, it's us that almost from the first moment uh, start saying, because that child is a biological girl, this is going to be true of her life, this is going to be true of her personality, this is going to be true of who she is, and we do that with boys as well. Um, and so we are inviting people to think about how those gender stereotypes come into play as uh, we're looking at leadership. Do we, in the back of our minds, really have a voice whispering to us that uh, leadership is correlated with men? You know, if we close our mind's eye and we're asked to imagine a leader do is the first thing in our head a man in a suit. Um, is it? You've looked at lots and lots of research. Uh, we've looked at lots and lots of research and unfortunately, um, yes is the answer to that, um, there's been research, um, polling research and other forms of research over many years now where people are asked about 
character traits they believe to be male and female, and then they're asked about character traits they believe that leaders need to have, and the correlation between the male character traits and the ones they believe leaders should have is very close. Um, it's not immutable, it's changed over time. So uh, people now are more likely to nominate um, collaborative, engaging leadership styles, perhaps, you know, flatter management structures and new technology means people still, means people are more likely to want that sort of collaboration than hierarchy and command and control. And they associate those traits disproportionately with women. Um, so it can change. But still, at the moment, the traits people see for leadership and male traits are much closer than the traits people see women as having and leadership. And the higher up the level of leadership, the stronger that connection is. So that's why we say um, there's a famous research that is, you know, think, uh, think, think manager, think male. Uh, we actually build on that and say, you know, think prime minister or president, think male. Is that you know, whirring around our heads and is that an explanation for some of the ways we react to women leaders? Will you tell a brief story about your, I think she's your great niece and the playground equipment? Yes, uh, I, I uh, mentioned my uh, great niece Isla and my great nephew uh, Ethan in the book. Uh, they're growing up uh, here in, in Adelaide and uh, there was uh, Ethan's birthday party last year where they went to a particular form of play activity and when they came back from it, we were, you know, talking to them, excited little kids, um, and said to Isla, you know, how did you find it? Do you, did you like it? And she said, oh, it was just for boys. We sort of looked and said, anyway, we um, inquired, uh, what's this all about? And actually, it was for children who met a particular height requirement, and she didn't because she's two years younger than Ethan, and so she's smaller. Uh, and no one in my family would have said to her, you can't do this activity because you're a girl. Yet somewhere she'd picked up. It's not because I'm little, it's because I'm a girl that I can't go and play with the others at Ethan's birthday party. And it was just a real reminder that it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> and, and even parents who go out of their way uh, to make sure that it's not in their family home, and many parents do, uh, these you know, these things come in. I mean, I, I didn't tell this story in the book, um, but I remember uh, being, uh, I was waiting somewhere, I think I was probably waiting for a plane in the days that one could. Um, and when we were flying, you know, I was flying around the world um, and literally hearing a mother lose an argument with her young daughter about pink is for girls. So, you know, with the certainty of a five or six year old, this young girl's going, pinks for girls. And this mother's going, no, but you know, daddy's got a pink shirt. No, no, pinks. <laughs> you, know, and, and you, could, you would see this, you know, woman thinking, you know, I, I'm losing an argument with my child around gender stereotyping. And like, I'm what, doing what, everything. What on earth is going Julia, on? <laughs> my family had exactly the same. Pete bought a pink t-shirt for that reason. And our daughter aged, you know, three, you don't wear that daddy. Oh. I mean, we'd done everything. Yeah. <laughs> we gave her toys, which were hammers and nails, and she put them to bed. <laughs> you know, you try, don't you? You try. I want to get on to some more specifics, but just one more thing. Um, I, I was taken by your comment that the most peaceful and prosperous version of our planet cannot be reached without better including women. Now, that's taking a very big jump from, you know, the playground equipment, I know, to management styles, um, pyramid styles, business, politics. This is taking us to the global crisis we face. Could you tell us more about that moment? Sure. We, uh, in, in the book, uh, take a, a look at some of the global research about uh, how we develop peace and prosperity. And uh, it's very clear that, for example, in war-torn societies, conflict uh, societies, that if women are included at the decision-making table that makes a peace agreement, that it is far more likely that that peace agreement will hold over time. Um, all of the economists and private sector uh, people who study these things will tell us that if uh, women 
uh, around the world were able to get education at the same rates as men, if they were able to access the labour force in the same way, uh, that global GDP, that the you know amount that our world generates um, as its wealth uh, would be turbocharged. You know, the statistics are measured in the trillions of dollars. That's our bigger jump that we're talking about. And so we draw on that kind of information to say, well, look, if we are systemically excluding uh, women and girls from, you know, education, from the labour force, from equal pay, uh, from politics, from business, then we're not being the best, best version of the planet we can be. Now, does that have something to do with women and leadership? Well, we show in the book that yes, it does, because there's this wonderful study from India about the impact of women being village leaders and that impact on girls in the village, particularly if they see two women lead the village. Um, so over time, they see two women leaders. Girls in the village um, then express the view that, uh, you know, they could be a leader, they want to be able to choose their own occupation rather than... Um, their society telling them that they need to be a wife and mother and not work or in Indian society that the occupation of the girl when she marries will be defined by her husband's parents, which um, is was the norm in these village settings, um, that that then makes a difference to her contemporaneous behaviour. She studies more and does better at school because she can see it leading to something instead of it, her life being one where, what's the point of hitting the books because I know I'm going to be just a housewife and not be in the paid workforce. So, you know, we put all of this together and say, you know, there's a, a series of threads here that can make a very beautiful picture and it is about a peaceful and prosperous world, but we've got to make sure if we want to get there that the threads of gender equality and women's leadership are interwoven. We'll come back to education, of course, and poverty. We can't avoid either of them. OK, so I want to come to your hypotheses now. You both say, OK, we're going to give you eight women and eight hypotheses, theories which we've come up with from experience and other people's research, and we're going to give them a go, give them a run. Number one, you go, girl. <laughs> so would you just broaden that one out for me? Sure. Uh, the the way uh, the book is structured, whilst we did the interviews, we don't present it uh, chapter by chapter. We don't have a chapter on Hillary and a chapter on Ellen. Uh, instead, uh, our main chapter structure is around a series of hypotheses which we test. And we've drawn these from the research overwhelmingly. And we've uh, asked our women leaders about them. And really, the proposition we're putting to our women leaders is the research says this, did you live it or didn't you live it? Do you think the research lived in your life or was real life quite different to this material that was generated by psychologists and other forms of researchers? Uh, and the first proposition we put to them is, you go girl, we summarise it as, but it's really whether they grew up in an environment that was permissive of the proposition that women could lead. Um, and each of our women leaders uh, says that in their family homes, they were taught to think big and to aspire about their future. So none of them was told, um, look, you know, young Ellen or, you know, young Erna or young Jacinda, you must grow up and be Prime Minister or President. Like, that's what we want you to do as parents. No one was treated like that. But they were all, what they were, um, had conveyed to them was that, you know, they could make what they wanted to out of their lives. And many of them had um, childhood experiences of leadership in schools and in scouts and in other areas. And so we, out of this, uh, believe that the proposition that the family home can help create a woman, a, a woman leader uh, is proven. So, you know, and, it matters. And it's not always, Julia, from your examples in the book that these women came from upper-class families, lots of privilege, lots of money, and said, you can be anything you want to be. Um, and I'm looking at you and your co-author's life experiences, where, in fact, her parents both had PhDs, both the high expectations of education, 
all kids expected to go to uni. Your parents didn't finish high school. So did you get some version of you go girl? Yes, I did, um, in the sense that uh, neither of my parents finished high school, my father leaving school at 14, uh, but both of them are very intelligent, uh, regretted, uh, were wistful about the fact that they never got to finish school, uh, wanted my sister and I to have better than that, to have a great education and, you know, gave expression to their desire for us to have the best possible chance in life by literally migrating around the world. We came from Wales in the United Kingdom to Australia because they thought we would have a better life here. And so we did grow up with the sense that, you know, this is about opportunity, you've got opportunity, you know, you should make the most of it, education's precious, never take it for granted, you know, you're getting an education, we didn't. Uh, and so that, I think, was this permissive environment about aim high. Which can be a burden for some children, can't it? I never had anything, but you've got all the opportunities and some children turn right against that. Yeah, and I think it's, um, it, it is this question of, uh, permissive versus directive. Uh, I mean, m uh, my uh, parents, you know, never uh, said to my sister and I, you know, you you will be failures unless um, it was much more on the opportunity side. You know, if you want to, you, you can go to uni. If you want to be a doctor, you can be a doctor. If you want to be a lawyer, you can be a lawyer. You know, you have to work hard and you have to hit those books and, you know, all the rest of it. But these things are possible for you. And they certainly never said those things are for the boys. Interestingly, two things there. Every single one of the women that you interview, including the two authors, um, you've all talked about working incredibly hard. So we just take that as a given, I think. Um, the other thing you've just touched on is you have a sister. And it was interesting looking at all of the women that you chose. Some had brothers, some only had sisters, Teresa was the only one, I think, as an only child. That's right. Did having brothers make a difference to your leaders' concept of themselves as future leaders? I don't think we can say that um, exactly. Uh, what we can say is many of our, uh, you know, leaders had uh, childhood experiences that put high degrees of responsibility on them early. Um, that's not particularly true of me um, uh, and not true of Ngozi either, uh, but it is true of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf with the loss of her father. Um, it is uh, true in many ways too of uh, Joyce Bander. Uh, it's true of uh, Christine Lagarde, whose father died when she was a teenager. Uh, Michelle Bachelet had this, you know, searing experience. She was, um, you know, imprisoned for a period when uh, uh, fascism took over her country. Um, so, you know, many uh, came up against various forms of adversity um, and that left its mark on them about responsibility uh, and the, the taking of responsibility sort of led them to... Um, ambition to hard work and was, you know, one of the foundation stones for where they ended up. Rather than whether you can beat your brother up and win. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, I did laugh. Hypothesis two. <laughs> it's all about the hair. It's all about the hair. Uh, uh, this is our hypothesis around uh, whether there is a greater focus on appearance for women leaders. And, um, you know, it's almost a kind of no-brainer because the answer is yes. But, oh, really? Yeah, we do unpack some of the research around it and we ask each of our women. And we um, uh, got the it's all about the hair from uh, Hillary Clinton because she had been known to joke that during her period when she was... Uh, Secretary of State in President Obama's administration and she was flying round the world constantly, uh, that there were times that she just pulled her hair back in a ponytail. The uh, scrunchie. With a scrunchie, yeah. uh, you know, a colourful elastic covered band. Um, and uh, it, she, she joked she was going to write, call her book about that period, you know, a hundred and something uh, country. She was going to call it the Scrunchy Chronicles, you know, more than a hundred countries visited and it still all about the hair. <laughs> she also quotes, though, a hideous figure that when she was running for, this is the campaign, 2016, I think. Yes. An hour a day on hair and makeup. Yes. 
which I went, oh, OK, right. But she then says, that's an hour a day I didn't have to campaign. Over a whole campaign, that's 24 days I didn't have to campaign. Yeah, I mean, it's... Put it like that. That's hideous. Yeah, it's crazy. It? It's crazy. And, you know, we... Um, we refer to uh, President Obama in this because he is um, he's famous for the saying uh, that, you know, I wear, I wear the same kind of suit every day, same kind of shirt, same kind of tie because I have to make so many decisions. You know, every day I'm President of the United States, I've got to make so many decisions that if I can get decisions out of my day, then I do. I won't so, choose what to eat or wear. I won't it's choose done. what to <laughs> eat or wear. It's done. Um, now, might mean he didn't have a very varied diet, but, um, you know, he uh, done. And it, we just make the point that, you know, that set of choices in is actually not available to women leaders. You know, you actually think about it. Could a woman leader uh, be on her na- nation stage and the world stage wearing exactly the same thing every day uh, with a wash and wear haircut, no blow drying, no fiddling whatsoever, uh, and flat shoes? And no makeup? And no makeup. It's what President Obama did every day. And know. the answer is? No. Not faintly. No. I mean, you'd probably say the closest, um, you know, uh, you know, leaders like uh, Angela Merkel, Chancellor Merkel of uh, Germany, uh, and Hillary talks about this herself, they've developed a look, at least in what they wear, that they don't vary from in the hope of closing down commentary around the clothes. Margaret Thatcher did it, actually, with the blue suit, didn't she? Yes, with she did. the iron hair and the blue suit. Yes, and the pearls. And, yes, um, and it, but it never changed, really. It, it never changed. And, yeah. and we talk uh, in very different contexts to our leaders about did they effectively get their own kind of uniform. Mm. Um, you know, men have the benefit of an already accepted uniform you, that we accept that male leaders will be wearing suits, ties, shirts. Um, then in some countries in the world, there's a, you know, traditional dress. You know, you look at uh, President Modi of India, for example, a traditional dress that he wears, but it's basically a uniform. You know, each day they're going to come out in effectively the same thing. Um, we talk to our women leaders about did they ultimately end up trying to close down the commentary on their appearance by developing their own little uniform? And the answer is, uh, by many of them, effectively, yes, including uh, for our African leaders doing that but wearing traditional African dress or a contemporary version of African dress. Otherwise, the news becomes, how can she wear the same suit two days in a row? I mean, really? Yes, uh, Michelle Bachelet talks about that, <laughs> about, about uh, the one time that she was covered in what is apparently a very big-selling women's magazine um, in uh, South America, that the commentary was she wore the same jacket twice in a week or twice in a fortnight or something like that. A woman couldn't possibly look like Boris Johnson as a leader. Yeah, when we- I, say, I say that, the messy hair, looking like you've just gone out of bed. Yeah, we Couldn't do it. we explored that with uh, Theresa May, um, and uh, she's obviously uh, careful in what she says because she doesn't want to be reflecting on her successor, which is uh, proper of her, very proper. Uh, but she um, does end up saying that a woman who routinely looked dishevelled with, you know, bits of clothing coming untucked and unkempt hair uh, would be unlikely to be pre-selected by the Conservative Party and even be in Parliament. <laughs> Julia, I've forgotten the story, um, you'll know where it comes from in your book, of the women in one country who, if they didn't get what they wanted, planned to go naked. Uh, that What's was the, the, the uh, women's protests in Liberia. In Liberia. Uh, as part, right. of, uh, part of the uh, endeavours to settle the civil war in what came to be known as the Accra uh, Peace Accords. So Muslim and Christian women came together, pushed, 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 ultimately said... We'll take our clothes off yes. if you don't agree with this, which is the ultimate shame. It's like a hideously bold thing to do. That's right. I mean, yeah. it's obviously uh, cultural context specific. I mean, here but in Australia, the if a group of yeah. um, demonstrating women said they were going to take their clothes off, that would cause, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, a frisson, but sort of an interest. But whereas, it's the other end of the same story in it, a way, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, whereas in Liberia, that was viewed as... Um, 
unthinkable, unthinkable that uh, women should uh, do this, unthinkable that women should even be contemplating doing it. This is, you know, how m much they care about the peace settlement being finalised. Therefore, they won the argument. It's extraordinary. Shrill or soft, which is the style conundrum, isn't it? Do you talk loudly? Do you talk quietly? High voice, low voice? Margaret Thatcher, once again, an extraordinary example because she completely changed the way she spoke. One of your leaders did the same thing. She said, I've got to learn how to do this, this talking thing. Will you talk to me around shrill and style? Yeah, we... Um, we we do talk about voice, but we mean it more broadly I than know. voice. Yes, and, yes. Uh, but, but to come to voice, uh, there is this uh, beautiful uh, paragraph in there. Uh, you know, Michelle Bachelet, uh, whose, you know, father uh, died having been tortured by the dictatorship. She was imprisoned. Her mother was imprisoned. They were both tortured by the dictatorship. Uh, her father had been a general uh, before uh, power shifted in her country and uh, he was on the wrong side of that struggle. Uh, so he'd been on the, not the wrong side, he was, uh, 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 that's not the right word, he was on the losing side. So according to the powers of the day. According was the to wrong the powers side. of the day. Yes. Um, so, you know, her father had been a general, this family history, she ends up being sworn in as Minister for Defence. And people said to her, you know, at that moment, what were you thinking of? Expecting her to say, I was thinking about my father, the general, and, you know, his example to me uh, and how he was tortured de to death. I was thinking of him. And she says, what I was actually thinking of is I can't speak in a soft, girly voice. Um, which it's so telling. It's very moving, yeah, actually, yeah. because, of course, you're much more widely talking about style of leadership, aren't you, and style of presentation. And we get back to, um, is she got to man up and be tough like a man? Is she going to be gentle like a woman? How have your women, your leaders, found their way through that maze, do you think, to find some commonality? Yeah, it, it it was different once again, depending on on context. Um, what what the research shows, and we've already discussed a little bit of this, is um, because we've got these gender stereotypes in our head about men and women and about leadership. Uh, women have in a kind of narrow path to walk. You've you've got to be strong enough to lead. So if people think. Uh, you're a stereotypically weak female and they won't see you as a leader. <laughs> it's um, pretty shocking words, aren't they? Yeah, you know, stereotypical that's why I'm doing my, my, air, uh, yeah, my air quotations. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if you present as, you know, you know tough, strong, single-minded, all of those things, a sort of strong man leader, but you're a woman, people will react against that because they'll think it will be offensive to them uh, against the gender stereotypes they hold in their head. They expect women to be more caring, more empathetic, more nurturing. Oh, you're none of those things. Oh. Um, <laughs> and so you've got to weave together strength and empathy. And if you tip one or other side of the line too strong, People will react, you know, adversely to you. Too warm and caring, eh, she's not strong enough to lead. And so we try and explore the staying on that path. And, um, you know, different leaders felt it differently. Um, you know, Hillary certainly uh, felt it and one of the uh, big political pushes against her was this analysis that she's not likeable. Um, Whereas, for example, uh, Michelle Bachelet and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, because of what they'd been through, and it was publicly known what they'd been through, um, they were, n even though uh, Michelle in particular comes across as a very warm, empathetic woman, uh, they were not characterised as too weak for the job because people knew what they had survived and endured. Um, and so that was one area where real life introduced all these context-specific um, differences that meant you couldn't just pick up the research and put it down for every woman and say, yes, it holds true. So everyone actually did a bit of each 
And I guess that's where we're up to, isn't it? A bit tough, a bit feeling, and then try and be yourself and not a robot, which is what Theresa May was uh, criticised for, wasn't it? Having no affect, if you like. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, and, you know, because of the... Uh, Theresa May was caricatured as... Uh, the Maybot she was referred to, which obviously a play on her name and the word robot, but uh, was particularly applied to her election campaigning style uh, to suggest that she lacked, you know, warmth and was uh, very uh, mechanical in her responses. So we do uh, try and explore that as a potential outworking of this, you know, shrill or soft style conundrum. So if you're a young woman, for instance, watching this and listening to this and reading your book, There are no clear answers to any of these, but what you're raising and what we're talking about are the many questions that it's pretty wise to ask yourself at various stages. What will my style be? And I guess practice them, really, um, in in your life. We're we're real believers that um, forewarned is forearmed. And, you know, uh, there's no... You know, we are not saying, um, you know, if you if you dress like this and act like this, then you will be <laughs> immune to any adverse char- uh, characterisation based on gender. No way, no way, no way. There's no style guide. Uh, no. Uh, you know, uh, everyone, every leader, every woman who wants to be a leader uh, has to forge their own path. But if you know these things, then you won't be surprised when they make some differences to how people see you. Hypothesis four, she's a bit of a bitch. She's a bit of a bitch. (laughs) You set that one up and tried to find the experience, the research. Yes. Fill that one in for us. Yes, we did. And we knew it might be controversial to call a chapter using the B word. She's a bit of a bitch. But uh, we we moved even uh, a step beyond this uh, shrill or, uh, or soft style conundrum and looked at some truly remarkable research about how people react uh, to strong women. And so to to give you an example of this research, um, uh, university got, uh, you know, randomised control trial groups of voters um, and they get them to score a political candidate Um, including whether or not they'd vote for them. So they've got actors, um, you know, pretending that they want to be elected as, you know, senator for whatever in the US. So two different groups of voters, exactly the same script, but the actor pretending to be a candidate in one group's a man and the actor pretending to be a candidate in another group's a woman. And the script has got in it lines like, you know, I'm the sort of person who gets things done and sometimes I've got to step on people's toes to get things done, but I always do. Um, and when that line is delivered by a male candidate, fine. When it's delivered by a female candidate, eh. and when they do the voting intentions, less people prepared to vote for her. As clear as that. As clear as that. That, you know, if you own power that strongly, if you own, own it that strongly, you've so offended against those whispering stereotypes in the back of people's heads, including our own, that people will say, she's a bit of a bitch, um, you know, I'm not, don't like her, I really don't like her, she's a bit of a bitch. And um, some of the researchers who have unpacked this um, say the, the reaction is so visceral that they use words like contempt and disgust to explain it. Well, they're very strong It's very words. deep, isn't it? Very deep. It's very deep. Um, and it's it's in us, you know, and it's and it's not uh, it's not me or Ngozi saying it's in you, it's in us, you know, it's in all of us. Yeah. And if we're honest, I think we probably can all imagine or think about a time in our lives when we've looked up a hierarchy at a woman leading and thought to ourselves, oh, you know, she's not pretty tough, she's pretty hard boiled, doesn't seem very nice. Um, and you've got to ask yourself now, were any of those things true? Or did I see that or conclude that because of this stereotyping? Um, so we, we work our way through that. This is the one that um, uh, we, with the women leaders, uh, most of them didn't think it held true for them. Mm. Um, 
and you know we we end up musing you know is that because people don't say it to you because the research in fact says the opposite yeah, doesn't it yeah the research says the opposite yeah. and you know people are unlikely to sprint up to a female leader and say well, I reckon you're really I don't like you at all. Um, you know, people don't do yeah. things like that, but they, yeah. they might think them. Uh, Hillary's, obviously, because she wrote her book, What Happened, um, about the 2016 campaign, she's thought about a lot of this stuff deeply, so she talks about it. But, yeah, we find most of, overwhelmingly our women leaders didn't think this held true for them in their lives. Hypothesis five that you put up, who's minding the kids? Who's minding the kids? Uh in it, we, uh, I mean, this is something I had a sense of from my time in politics. You know, I'd talk to, um, you know, you have male and female colleagues that have young kids uh, and it would only ever be the women who were asked by voters or at community meetings, look, you know, I know you want to be the elected member for whatever seat, but you've got young kids, like, how's this going to work? You know, none of the men in Parliament who also had young children ever got asked that question. So hence we framed it, who's minding the kids? And we try and explore uh, what are the arrangements that, um, you know, do make work and family life possible for those leaders who have children? How have they done it? And we also explore around Theresa May and around my experience, what characterisations are put on women who don't have children. Uh, Theresa May is uh, does not have children. Uh, she and her husband wanted children, but were unable to have them. Um, and we explore a bit of what that means when you are a woman, but you don't have the status of being a mother. And then we explore being a mother and trying to juggle, um, being a political leader. And of course, Jacinta Ardern is a very uh, contemporaneous example of that. And she says, I don't balance, I don't think, I just kind of get on with trying. Yes, I mean, she's very honest. She's very honest. um, In fact, I love, I follow her on Instagram and she posts in her pyjamas. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah, she's very honest. Uh, And she, you know, just says, uh, she ends up using expressions like, uh, I think we women are high guilt creatures and no matter how we're doing it, we feel like we should be doing it some other way and you sort of learn to live with that. And she talks about her partner being the, uh, you know, primary care giver for their baby, for their child, Neve, and she talks about how that's given permission for a lot of women whose uh, partners are the primary caregiver to talk about that experience and bring it to the forefront. So, and In fact, Anna Solberg does too, although she somewhat cynically, I think, talked about her husband. Didn't he get some fabulous prize of being father of the year yeah, or yeah. for being a yes, dad? Her, her, um, <laughs> in, in, a, in a society that um, has very uh, good uh, support for caring arrangements and for families, uh, for people in all walks of life, not just politics, uh, she does talk about the role that her, her husband played um, and he did win sort of, you know, father of the year or man of the year or something like that. And a number of her women uh, friends saying, oh, 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 I do all of that at my place and no one's running around giving me an award, you know, <laughs> somehow different if a man does it. <laughs> Hypothesis six, Julia, there's a special place in hell, which is part of the phrase that's attributed to Madeleine Albright for women who don't support other women. Do women really support other women? Should they? We? (laughs) Uh, Well, we we deal with all of the complexities of that and because it's complex, it's not a one-word answer. Uh, There is a view that um, an uh, analysis of uh, corporate structures tells you that if a woman makes it to the top, then... Uh, other women don't. And so there's been this image grow up that there are the kind of these queen bee sort of mean girl uh, women who make it to the top and then shove other women down so that they're the only one at the top of the tree. And the research actually debunks that. It's not the conduct of the women so much as uh, businesses who say, oh, 
a woman. We've got one of those. Tick. Uh, we don't need to appoint any more women managers. We don't need any more women on the board because we've got one. Um, and then in some countries where the standard has been um, to get two women on the board, we talk about tokenism. You know, so, oh, we've got two women, we're done, no more women. Uh, that's not needed. So this burden has sort of been put on women, whereas it doesn't really lie on women. It lies on organisations doing the bare minimum to meet expectations about gender change and then when they've done that bare minimum, they're done. Um, but we then explore with our women leaders, did you feel supported by women? When didn't you feel supported by women? Uh, we try and explore this concept that we call the politics of scarcity, uh, that because we have so many decision-making tables in our society where women still get the smaller share, you know, maybe 20% or 30% of the positions, that it creates this false competition that the women are running against each other for the smaller share rather than being in a fair competition with the men for half. And it's their fault, by the way, that there are so few. That's what a lot of women feel, isn't it? Yes, that's yes. right. Yes. Um, and this this was quite a mixed experience amongst our women. Some, some felt um, very supported by other women. Uh, others felt um, that you know, some of their predominant critics were women and that once particularly they were at or near the top, there wasn't much of a experience of sisterhood. Uh, Theresa May talks about female journalists who she thought were more critical of her than they would have been of a male prime minister in the same position. So almost um, overreacting uh, to a perception that they might be biased in her favour because they're a woman by being hypercritical. You know, I thought of that story as a former journalist. There's also the pressure as a young woman that you go out to interview another woman and the journalists back at the office say, she's going to be strong and she's going to be pathetic on the woman. Yes. So as the journalist, you feel like you ought to be tougher on the woman. It yep. goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Yeah. The next hypothesis, which is a pretty powerful title, Modern Day Salem, which is referring to the, the witch hunts, of course, um, there are witches everywhere, you write, Julia. And we'll remember, all of us, those hideous signs that were held up during rallies during your prime ministership. Um, do women leaders pay, this is one of the questions that you ask, the hypotheses, bigger prices for mistakes? And what's the research show? Yes, uh, we do try and explore uh, whether you know, you've got less ground to make an error. Mm. I mean, every, uh, you know, every leader, every politician, every human being makes errors. Um, so do do you make an error and get some form of forgiveness or do you make an error and it dis is disproportionately held against you if you're a woman? Uh, we did uh, look at some of the research here and it, it ended up saying yes, but where it says yes is you pay more of a price for a mistake if you are a leader doing a role that is not correlated with your, um, with your gender. And the, the main piece of research we cite is there's, uh, you know, people have been asked to react to the proposition. There's a, there's a protest on a campus and they're asked to react um, you know, the right number of police are called out and the protest is peaceful, everything's fine. Too few police are called out and the protest gets unruly and things are damaged and there's violence. Bad, right? So that's not complicated. Better to call out the right number of police. Uh, but they then test the proposition. Um, imagine that the female president of a women's college makes that decision and she gets it wrong. How do you feel about that? How do you feel if the president of the women's college is a man, which would be sort of almost unheard of, presidents of women's colleges in the United States are women, not men. How do you feel about it if the person who made the wrong decision was a male police chief? How do you feel about it if they were a female police chief? And the researchers found that people paid out more against the person who was in the gender non-congruent role. So the woman police chief was seen to have made worse of an error than the male police chief. The male president of the women's college was seen to have made worse of an error than the female president. So 
it's it's telling us that we take this stereotyping with us and there must be something in our heads that says they're liable to make that mistake because they're really not in the right job. And why is that about witches in Salem? Well, we really use the witches in Salem um, to, you know, because witch is such a commonly used insult against women leaders, it was used against me, whether you quickly move from um, accepting a woman leading to sharp characterisations against her because she's made an error. You know, there's no ground, no ground for forgiveness. It happens so quickly. It happens so quickly yeah, and the, yeah. the backlash is so profound. Uh, so we do look at all of that. We, we look at it mostly through the experience of a woman we didn't interview, uh, but the former president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff. Um, and we explore whether she, when she was impeached, was paying more of a price uh, than a male president of Brazil would have. And it's an it's an interesting way of shining a light on those issues. I found she, that a very puzzling and perplexing story, but it's a very good one to read. Good, informative yes, one to I think read. Informative and one that people uh, may not be familiar with, and it is mm. truly intriguing. Mm. Hypothesis eight, this is the last one, which is about the role modelling riddle. And again, it's a hypothesis. You ask the women, you test the research. And it's it's not clear, is it really? Some women had mentors, some didn't. Some women leaders had role models, some didn't. Um, some had negative role models. Where have you come out with that one? Yeah, I've come out looking at our leaders' experiences and the research on the basis that Role modelling does matter, but it's not as simple as saying, um, you know, as we all often do, uh, you can't be it if you can't see it. You know, that's a very, um, you know, much used uh, statement. Um, where this, where the complexity comes is role modelling works if women can feel some form of identification with the role model. If they look at the role model and think, she's superwoman and I could never be like that, then it's actually a discouragement. Yet, if the woman leader says, look, you know, it's so tough, it's so tough and every day I have to live through this, this and this and this, so I'm not superwoman, let me tell you just how hard I find it, if you go too far down that line, you discourage. Um, so you've got to have this path in the middle where you are reminding of the joys of leadership. Why should a woman want to be a leader? And, but, and you're being practical and informative about the stresses and strains in it, but not putting other women off. And I think um, because we sort of can be a bit naive about role modelling and just think, if there is a woman who's leading, she's a great role model, it's all good. Um, we, we aren't missing this, oh, sorry, we are missing this discouragement effect and we've got to understand that and make sure that we're not falling into it. And this is the age of simple answers to complex questions and we've just got to resist that, don't we? Nothing could prove that more than the complexities that you and your co-author have uncovered. Julia, just really towards the end, there are standout lessons um, <laughs> and I'll just summarise a few of them. It's not really about the hair, you tell us, <laughs> but expect it. Expect that there will be issues about your appearance if you're a woman who's going to be having a go at leadership and wear, work out strategies. Be wary, you say, of gendered advice in this area. Um, there's no right way, you tell us, to be a female leader and the examples are such beautiful uh, of, your, of your leaders, such beautiful examples of that. <laughs> the bit of a bitch versus smile all the time, that's an interesting one. The advice is what to a young woman? <laughs> do you smile a lot? Like Anna Solberg says, I do smile. Or do you do the hmm, firm, 
<laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah, we we recount in the book this uh, wonderful discussion with Erna Solberg, the Prime Minister of Norway. So you've got to imagine uh, the moment we're actually in Brussels because she'd been at a European Union meeting. We're meeting in the Norwegian embassy to Brussels. So all, you know, blonde panelled wood in that kind of uh, uh, decorator style. And, uh, you know, Erna Solberg is telling us, I had to ask my media advisor, What's resting bitch face? You know? <laughs> and, I like this. You know, the so-called phenomenon that uh, women's faces at rest can look bitchy. And, and Erna says, now I smile a lot more. Uh, we don't think you can. <laughs> um, we don't think... One of your other guests, by the way, um, she's older... It might have been Goni, actually. Yeah. Um, says, I've noticed it. I've got older, everything drops a <laughs> bit. So yeah. she tries to keep it up. <laughs> I did laugh. Yeah, we had, uh, <laughs> we had lots of fun with this. Um, uh, and it's not as simple as you can out- outsmile it. Um, and, you know, it, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no one answer to all of these differences and in that final um, chapter, the standout lessons, we don't put the burdens of addressing them all on the shoulders of women leaders. We talk about what the media should do, what men should do, uh, what you know others should do to make sure that we're creating a better environment for women to lead in. But for the women leaders, we basically say, look, be alive to the fact that um, there are these reactions to uh, powerful women And, you know, uh, we explore in the book um, the example, uh, there was a time when the uh, candidate for the Democratic primary in the US was a young man called Beto O'Rourke, who did a Vanity Fair interview, which was uh, famous for the line, man, I was born for it. You know, I was born to be president of the United States. And he paid a price for that. But there were other lines in that interview about, you know, I think I'd be good at it. You know, I think I'd be good at president, being president. And we explore what penalty would a woman pl- pay for claiming ambition as squarely as that. And Self-ambition yeah, to, know, rather than you know, I'll help other people. Yeah, exactly. You, 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 don't, um, you don't hear women leaders basically saying, you know, um, uh, why, why do you want to be Prime Minister of Australia? Because I'd be good at it. Oh, well, I'd like okay. people to admire me when I walk into a room. Yeah, you know. I'm sounding like a man already. <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. Um, and and so we don't say we don't say don't claim ambition um, or don't talk in powerful and strong terms, but we do say say be aware of potential reactions. Yes, yes. I think be aware is a very big lesson from the work that you've both done. So, Julia, I'm going to do this again because I love doing this because I <laughs> always worked at the ABC and we weren't allowed to advertise this. <laughs> Women and leadership, real lives, real lessons. I have only one more question. How long until we have another female Prime Minister of Australia? Oh, I don't I know. I know you haven't got a number, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, here. look... Um... Because some women said it was easier because there'd been someone before. But then there's the one you've mentioned. Oh, we've had a woman, um, newsreader, doctor, leader, hmm, we don't need to do it again. (laughs) Yeah. I, um, look, I am optimistic uh, if I uh, have my 60th birthday next year, which I do, um, and I'm hoping to live uh, a long and healthy life, so touch wood, whatever. Um, if if that comes true, uh, then I think I will live to see a number of more female Prime Ministers in Australia. I think more women will do the job. And I think that's uh, particularly... Uh, true on the labour side over that sort of sweep of decades that I'm thinking about uh, because we've done so much on affirmative action to bring women through. You know, you can't routinely have women prime ministers if you don't start with basically having half-half the members of parliament in your political party women and then having around half-half the women in the ministry and half-half in cabinet because in our system you, you know, The people who are thought about for leadership are the people who have come through to those senior levels already, like holding a cabinet level portfolio. And because we've done so much change and there are so many women um, and that will continue into the future, I'm optimistic about the Labor side. I think quite a bit needs to be done on the Conservative side to bring more women in, 
so that there's, you know, more and more women and more and more possibilities over time. This can never be um, a, a story about the one woman. You know, politics, um, politics is complicated. Life can be vexed. You know, um, in, after every election, newspapers will write, here are the, you know, six newcomers who are the talented ones to watch. Um, if that story is five men and one woman, one woman, then you're, you've kind of lost it before you've begun. It's got to be three men and three women and then they'll go about their political careers and good things will happen and bad things will happen and people will exit politics for family reasons or whatever. You know, all of the things that are just life and politics will happen, but a few of those will emerge into contention for leadership and you want an equal number of the potential contenders to be women if you're routinely going to end up with women in the top job. Julia Gillard, thanks for what you've done and thanks for speaking to us today. It's been a great conversation. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.